Thank you. Anything additional? Anything from finance? Anything from the LAO's office? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Meredith Worden with the LAO. We would note that this program is able to leverage federal Medicaid reimbursement. Um, and the governor's proposal does not consider policy alignment with the state Medicaid plan for consideration of a case of a lead poisoning. To the extent that there is alignment with the state Medicaid plan, federal dollars could be maximized. Thank you. Any public comment? There's also uh, three questions we can respond to whenever please, you're. Please do. So, um, the first one, actually, I'll comment on the uh, um, state plan amendment for um, this health care services is obviously the uh, program that's involved with this, but we've, we've been coordinating with them and um, been preparing a state plan amendment uh, regarding this program. They've been working on it for some time, and with this proposal, um, they've indicated that they intend to maximize federal resources and try and adjust the uh, levels that they can provide Medi-Cal matching uh, funds for so that we would be able to have that for the kids that are being case managed. Um, the other thing I'll add is, um, you know, I, I want to emphasize this, this proposal, as Greg described, is to serve more children and uh, children at lower blood lead levels. And uh, we're, we estimate that right now we serve about 200 uh, children a year in that category, and we estimate it'll go up to about 600 with this proposal. So we'll be able to reach farther down. Any level of lead in the blood is is not uh, good for health. So uh, regardless of the source, we'll be investigating uh, more children. We're also providing services to children who aren't officially considered cases. So it'll be some outreach services, and this proposal will also pay for that. And that's a, um, several thousand children that we'll be adding on in that area. So as far as the questions go, I'll, I'll dive into those. Um, the first one that was provided to us was uh, what are the most common sources of lead exposure for children in California? And um, part of what we do is uh, go out and addition to nurse case management services and providing those services follow up for two or three years to make sure children's blood lead levels go down and stay down. We also do environmental uh, evaluations and look for the sources of lead and that's really how the problem is addressed. So for um, historically, most of the sources have to do with lead-based paint and the legacy of lead-based paint, uh, particularly where it's um, degrading or there's been some disruption such as remodeling and things like that. Um, there are also uh, lead-contaminated soil and dust that we identify, and those are probably the two biggest ones. Uh, the paints probably two-thirds to three-fourths of cases have some, some connection to lead-based paint. Um, about a third are from uh, soil, and then uh, the remainder are from uh, a number of other potential sources. Maybe have a parent that works in an industry that brings something home on their clothes. Um, we've heard all heard about, I'm sure, I hope, about ceramics. Certain ceramics can have lead in the glazing. Um, sometimes there's candies that have lead in them. Um, cosmetics that are imported um, sometimes have lead and home remedies, things like that. But those collectively are about a third of the cases have that exposure. And those fractions, if anyone doing math, don't add up to one because you can have multiple exposures in a kid, if you guys are tracking my math. <laughs> um, so um, the next question is about water, and I, I didn't really mention water in the previous response because um, probably we find water as a risk for less than 1% of the kids that we uh, are evaluating in our program. And we do test water in the home for every kid. That's part of the evaluation. And for those children um, where it has been identified, it's been a plumbing fixture typically that simply needs to be replaced. Um, we haven't identified it in the, in the source water in children. Uh, the uh, last question refers to the um, recent uh, work that we did for Exide, for not for Exide, for the Department of Toxic Substance Control regarding uh, the Exide battery recycling plant in Los Angeles that was uh, recently closed and the uh, potential for lead contamination in the environment around that plant. And so because we have a repository of blood lead levels in children um, across the state, every blood lead test has to be reported to us. Uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control asked us to look at that. We've been collaborating with them on this for a number of months and providing information back and forth and um, ultimately have produced an analysis that was released just this past Friday by the Department of Toxic Substance Control. So I, I don't know if you saw that in the news media, but that analysis is posted on their website. 
and basically describes work that we did in an area around the Exide battery recycling plant. Um, and we looked at children in the year 2012, and uh, nearly 12,000 children were evaluated, uh, had had results in that region, unique children. And we found uh, about 285 of those children had blood levels above five, five or above. So that's, uh, that analysis is available on their website. The, of course, the cleanup at, uh, around the Exide facility is uh, DTSC's lead agency, and uh, we just have provided this consultation because we have information on blood lead testing. Um, I can go into more detail about that, but I think we probably, in the interest of time, you know, for, for describing what the report is about, that's that's in the introductory section of that report that's posted. Thank you. Was there something else from finance? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to issue number nine. We'll leave the proposal open. We'll move on to issue nine, the biomonitoring program, limited term funding, budget change proposal, and stakeholder augmentation proposal. Uh, we welcome back Mark Starr and Greg Oliva. Nancy Burmeyer uh, from the Breast Cancer Fund. We're going we're gonna to give somebody the boot so that you can <laughs> present. Um, uh, but we always welcome you back. So, um. Mr. Chair, the BCP first? Please. Okay. Uh, so we're requesting for the biomonitoring program uh, funding to, uh, limited term funding to support two positions within the program, $350,000 from the toxic substance control account. Uh, these positions were established in a budget change proposal in fiscal year 1415, so they will expire on June 30th of this year. So just a simple request um, to provide the funding to, for the, uh, two more years um, to support those positions. Um, the biomonitoring program has a uh, simple not simple, has a principal mandates to um, you know, measure the level of chemicals in Californians' blood and urine to conduct community-based studies and then to also um, determine whether policy approaches um, produced by the state are, are achieving the results that are intended. Um, you might have seen some interesting um, reports in the media over the past several weeks about a study called the Hermosa study, where, uh, which is known as the Health and Environmental Research on Makeup of Salinas Adolescents. So uh, we know that there are certain um, priority chemicals that we measure within the program that are contained within some um, cosmetics. Um, we, in partnership um, with some local organizations, worked, uh, our lab worked on, on some of this work, and these um, children stop taking cosmetics, uh, using cosmetics for a certain amount of days, and their, uh, the levels of these chemicals in their um, blood and urine dropped pretty dramatically over the course of just several days. So it's pretty, um, the impacts can be pretty immediate when people stop using these certain chemicals in their bodies. So. I think Mr. Oliva was making a lead-in for Ms. Burmeyer. If you want to go ahead and present, and then we'll hear from Finance LAO and public comment all at once. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, make a statement here. Um, the Breast Cancer Fund is a national organization focused on preventing breast cancer by getting chemicals like the ones tested in the Armosa study out of personal care products and other places where we're exposed to them. The data provided by the Biomonitoring California program is fu fundamental foundational to the work that we do. If we don't know how chemicals get into us, we can't figure out how to stop those exposures. On behalf of the Breast Cancer Fund and the Natural Resources Defense Council, we urge the committee to approve the budget change proposals that the administration has put forward and then augment those with an additional $1 million per year to be focused on environmental justice community studies. Having studies at the state level and the community level are really critical to being able to make meaningful changes in how people are exposed. We can look at communities, targeted communities, whether those be by location or um, occupation or culture, and be able to understand better how those exposures happen and then use that information to make changes through public health policies and behavioral changes to reduce those exposures. Absent that program, we only have national data to work with, and that national data would not address the very unique needs of the various populations, including EJ populations here in California. 
we were a sponsor of the of the legislation that created this the Biomonitoring California, which was the first such program in the country. And that was in 2006. Over the last decade, this program has grown to the premier state program in the country. This la our lab here is second only to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Lab. Um, we, the key as one key aspect of this program is the return of results to individuals, which empowers those individuals to make personal changes and engage in public policy changes to uh, affect those exposures and reduce the potential risks of those, of those exposures. To maintain that leadership, we're asking the committee to provide this modest investment to help the program expand and thrive. I just quickly want to give you one example of the kind of study that we're talking about. The Biomonitoring California is currently engaged in the Asian Pacific Islander Community Exposures Study, or the ACE study. It's looking at the levels of mercury and arsenic in Bay Area residents of Chinese descent. We know from national data that mercury and arsenic, two very dangerous metals, are high in Asian communities, but we don't know what those patterns look like here in the Bay Area. The Department of Public Health has tried to do educational interventions through signs and the like, but have also found that those interventions have not been successful. So a community organization, the Asian Pacific American Family Services um, organization has asked Biomonitoring California to do this study to better understand not only those exposures, but ways in which we can take action to reduce those exposures. The, the, the data will be returned to individuals, allowing those with clinical levels to get appropriate treatment, but also encouraging them to take personal action to reduce their exposures. They will also be used at a community level to continue to educate um, community members and to look for ways to, to make systematic change to reduce those exposures. When an individual gets their response, their individual results back, it motivates them to not only protect themselves and their families, but also to go into their community and help make the changes necessary to protect their full community. In short, this is a great program, and it's a program that has a lot more potential, but it needs some funding from the state to be able to realize that. Um, the requested $1 million augmentation, with that requested augmentation, the program could do approximately one to two EJ studies per year. As concern about environmental justice community increases, Biomonitoring California can play a key role in identifying the most concerning exposures and allowing the state to focus its scarce resources on addressing those exposures. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. We welcome back finance if there's any comment on this proposal. Anyone from finance? No, we have no position on the proposal. We support the BCP. Thank you. Uh, anything from the LEO's office? Uh, public comment? Any public comment? Please come forward. Good afternoon, Vina Singla with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, I just wanted to reflect for a moment on Dr. Smith's remarks at the beginning of this hearing about uh, determining public health priorities through comprehensive assessments and working with communities. And biomonitoring is a critical piece of that puzzle. Um, we talked about uh, chronic disease, uh, chronic diseases like childhood asthma, which are linked to environmental exposures, and uh, biomonitoring can help us to identify and mitigate those exposures and um, ultimately improve health outcomes um, for disproportionately impacted communities. Um, and we are in strong support of these proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and members. Reed Addis on behalf of the Center for Environmental Health and the Californians for a Healthy and Green Economy in strong support of our colleague from the Breast Cancer Fund and their proposal today. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kathy Dressler, and on this item I'm speaking just as a citizen. Became uh, painfully aware of the good work that the Breast Cancer Fund uh, does three years ago when my 30 year old daughter came down with breast cancer. Um, she is part of a growing number of very young women in the Bay Area <clears throat> that have triple negative cancer. And I just want to applaud the good work they do and the fact that they helped me so much during that time um, completely support their uh, 
collaboration with the state in order to find out why so many young women are struggling with breast cancer right now. Thank you. Thank you. And Matthew Marson with Public Health Institute in support of the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Uh, seeing none, I want to thank our presenters. Thank you very much uh, for that. We're going to leave this open, but continue this very important conversation, and we thank you for your ongoing work and advocacy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Um, Chair, the committee had two questions on this one, which we'd be happy to follow up in writing if that's easier that's for you. Thank you. Um, we, we, we have responses and be fairly straightforward to do. Thank you. We welcome you to remain for issue 10, the stakeholder proposal on Alzheimer's early diagnosis. I'm going to call um, the panel um, to come forward. Uh, I'm honored that uh, my colleague, Assemblymember Cooley, is here uh, to provide some context on the proposal. We also um, welcome uh, Dr. Charles DeCarly, uh, who is the director of the Alzheimer's Disease Center in Imaging of Dementia and Aging Laboratory. Um, please come forward, um, and we'll hear from Finance and LAO's office. Chairman, members of this committee, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Charles DeCarly. Um, I'm here in support of a one-time request for, um, for state budget funding to help California's 10 Alzheimer's um, disease centers meet the enormous challenge of preparing our community physicians to detect, diagnose, and treat Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. As director of the UC Davis Alzheimer's Disease Center and the Victor and Genevieve Vorsi Chair of Alzheimer's Disease Research, I am personally extremely concerned about the state of dementia care for the growing numbers and increasing diversity of our Californian elders. Advances in diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease is progressing rapidly. Despite these advances, however, primary care physicians who are at the forefront of the diagnosis and their allied health professionals are not receiving the education they need to identify the symptoms of dementia. And I think this is particularly important in our up underrepresented minorities. Diagnose the form of dementia. So dementia is a general term, and then there are various forms and then to prescribe currently approved treatments for the benefit of their patients. Consequently, the lack of the effective dementia diagnosis and management comes at a very high cost to the public and to the families who must bear this burden. For example, inadequate diagnosis and treatment planning leads to unnecessary medical care costs. So someone with an undiagnosed dementia generally costs four to five times higher than uh, those hospitalized with uh, other chronic disease. There's overutilization of clinic and emergency room visits, again, because of the uncertain diagnosis. The patients come in repeatedly, and this leads to expensive and repeated testing. Importantly, without a good diagnosis, recognized treatments are not being implemented. This results in a premature transition to supervised care, uh, particularly um, uh, supported living situations, and that um, these are expensive, skilled nursing and assisted living um, facilities, which are mostly supported, as you know, by Medi-Cal. And this year alone, it's estimated that Medi-Cal will pay up to $3 billion for this um, type of care. And finally, in a sort of an, in an odd tweak, um, there's inappropriate prescribing for people who do not need these medications with the attended side effects and then meta required medical intervention. In addition, the lack of care planning leads to the need for crisis intervention. So our police, fire, and other um, um, civil uh, officials are actually required to care for these people as they wander or uh, get lost in their um, neighborhoods or wherever they may be. And then, of course, the loss of economic productivity of children of dementia patients who are required to assume the caregiving uh, responsibilities and their increased stress and health uh, consequences. Uh, the constituents, your constituents and the constituents of California deserve better medical care, and they absolutely have the right to know their diagnosis. 
They also have the right to know their options for treatment and have those options implemented. In fact, there's strong evidence to support the fact that the quality of life improves and health care costs are lowered when an individual with dementia has a documented diagnosis in his or her medical record. A diagnosis is the gateway to advanced care planning, social support, chronic disease management, and care coordination. On behalf of myself, my colleagues, um, and those who diagnose and treat dementia, I urge your committee to support a one-time budget augmentation to the California Department of Public Health to accelerate physician education and outreach on a statewide basis. With 610,000 Californians already affected and someone in America developing um, dementia every 66 seconds. Your constituents in our state budgets can't afford to wait any longer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. DeCarly. Um, Senator Member Cooley, we're honored to have you here for your context. Yes. Very good. Well, and I just thank you for the opportunity to sit in and follow your hearing. Uh, it just Good to watch the hearing and operation in general. We've got lead issues locally, a wide array of issues. Uh, very outstanding to be here today. Yeah, I am here to speak sort of in personal terms in support of this Department of Public Health $2.5 million uh, appropriation uh, to deal with early detection. I basically boil this down to it's about distilling what we know about uh, Alzheimer's and related conditions, uh, distilling it down, pushing it out to practitioners so they then can help families and then a measurement component to assess how well this pushing out has worked. Um, and uh, I see the importance of this in personal terms. I'm the, as I shared with you earlier, I'm the youngest of, of four boys. Two of my brothers lived in the Monterey Peninsula with my mom who had the onset of Alzheimer's. And I can say, as a family, we, early on, it's like, well, mom is not remembering her medications. You order she's taking her medications. We're a little worried she uh, keeps taking her pills because she forgets when she last took them. Mom is out wandering in Pacific Grove and got a little bit disoriented. We're not quite sure what caused that. And uh, this problem of helping families understand what it is you're dealing with so they can re respond in an appropriate way is very, very important. And it's an area where I think distilling the best knowledge and making sure it's in the hand of practitioners who are dealing with these families, and in particular families for whom uh, if you don't have great access to health care, which is also one of the themes of this proposal, you want to make sure that in the contact they do have, they get outstanding, accurate, understandable information, which is an object of this. Uh, in my own family, I was the lawyer, but probably my principal qualification was I was the baby of the family. And my brothers sort of reached common agreement that when it came to talking with my mom about, we don't quite know what's going on, mom, but maybe we ought to make some adjustments in how your financial affairs are set up, that you know, having me as a co-signer and kind of working through those issues with an alien parent for whom you could see some looming issues if you don't address those. Uh, these are the sorts of issues that families deal with as they struggle to love their, uh, love their loved ones. The practical knowledge I think that this would help by pushing out would be immensely valuable. And so as I say, I just want to come out and strongly support this proposal. I know it, it'll be a loose end as we go forward just because of the nature of the budget process, but I thank you for your time. So, Member Cooley, thank you. We are sorry for your loss and the experiences of your family, but we appreciate you adding context on behalf of Californians and the proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, anything from Mr. Starr or Mr. Oliva? Uh, anything from Finance or the LAO's office? Uh, any public comment? Please come forward for public comment. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Howard Posner. I, coincidentally, I happen to be a former um, Assembly Committee consultant, but I'm here today as an Alzheimer's uh, volunteer, and also I lost both parents to dementia, one at age 63, one at age 97. <clears throat> so I've seen it from both ends, and I, I want to express my appreciation to Mr. Cooley for his support on this issue. Thank you. Sorry for your loss, and thank you for your service to this institution. 
Well, my name is Linda Rodesno, and I'm also here on behalf as an advocate for the Alzheimer's Association. My family's journey with this disease has been over a period of seven years. Um, lost my father in 2014 to Lewy body disease. My mother is currently in the late stages of Alzheimer's disease, and my mother-in-law was just recently diagnosed. So we've seen the difference, the impact that it has on families, but also how the lack of medical attention, specifically when you are Hispanic and your family reverts back to speaking Spanish, how difficult it is to get the support that is needed for families. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. My name is Deborah Johnson, and I am a former caregiver of my mother um, from 2007 to 2013. I cared for my mom, and getting a diagnosis was extremely difficult. We went to the doctor, and the doctor told us, you need to get another doctor. Wow. So we, I support this. Thank you. I'm Michelle Johnston with the Alzheimer's Association, also in support. Prior to joining the association, my father um, had some form of dementia related to Parkinson's. Um, the many doctors that he saw, nobody ever gave our family a diagnosis or connected us with resources that could have supported us in that journey. And I know that on at least two occasions, we took him to the emergency room for things that were basically a symptom of the disease. And if we'd had the education and had that diagnosis, we would have cost our system less money. We would have provided better better care for my father. So thank you. Thank you. I am Jessica Rothar from Oakland, California, and um, my experience was very similar to Michelle Johnston's with my grandfather. So I'm in support of the proposal. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan DeMorris with the California Council of the Alzheimer's Association. We are the sponsors of this proposal and I want to thank you Mr. Chairman and your staff for including us on the agenda today and to thank Assemblymember Cooley for his leadership on the issue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Modest. I'm with the California Brain Tumor Association. I'm in support of this, this measure. One of the things I wanted to bring up as part of the education to families is to let people know that microwave radiation from cell phones has been indicated in causing a variety of neurological problems, including early onset Alzheimer's and other psychiatric problems. And uh, I'm going to submit to the committee a study by Dr. Martin Paul from Washington State University, who's a cellular biologist and physicist, who explains the mechanism, how this affects the cells. And this is a relatively easy way uh, to treat this, is by minimizing people's exposure. And we're seeing a lot more early onset, and that can be explained by heavy duty exposure to wireless radiation. So I'll submit that to the committee. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Um, just want to thank all of the speakers, uh, you know, and, and for those who shared personal experiences and stories. Uh, we appreciate um, your sharing and sorry for your losses. Thank you for all of your testimony today. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. DeCauley. Thank you, Assemblymember Cooley. Um, thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, this item we're going to hold open for now, but we will take this up at a later time. I want to uh, move us to issue number 11. Uh, it's a stakeholder proposal for, for I'm, sorry, oh, I'm sorry, 11 for the Chronic Disease Trust Fund. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague who is here, Assemblymember Gomez, who will be adding context to the proposal, um, as well as Kat DeBerg from the Health Officers Association of California. And uh, we'll have representatives from the department, uh, Mark Starr and Greg Oliva, and uh, Finance and LAO's office. 